Chapter Fifteen, Section Four of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital, A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One, by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling and edited by Frederick Ingalls. Part Four: Production of Relative Surplus Value Chapter 15. Machinery and Modern Industry Section 4. The Factory At the commencement of this chapter we considered that which we may call the body of a factory, i.e., machinery organized into a system. We there saw how machinery, by annexing the labor of women and children, augments the number of human beings who form the material for capitalistic exploitation, how it confiscates the whole of the workman's disposable time by immoderate extension of the hours of labor, and how finally its progress, which allows of enormous increase of production in shorter and shorter periods, serves as a means of systematically getting more work done in a shorter time, or of exploiting labor power more intensely. We now turn to the factory as a whole, and that in its most perfect form. Dr. Ure, the Pindar of the automatic factory, describes it, on the one hand, as combined cooperation of many orders of workpeople, adult and young, intending with assiduous skill a system of productive machines, continuously impelled by a central power, the prime mover, on the other hand, as a vast automaton, composed of various mechanical and intellectual organs, acting in uninterrupted concert for the production of a common object, all of them being subordinate to a self-regulated moving force. These two descriptions are far from being identical. In one, the collective laborer, or social body of labor, appears as the dominant subject, and the mechanical automaton as the object, in the other, the automaton itself is the subject, and the workmen are merely conscious organs, co-ordinate with the unconscious organs of the automaton, and together with them, subordinated to the central moving power. The first description is applicable to every possible employment of machinery on a large scale. The second is characteristic of its use by capital, and therefore of the modern factory system. Ure prefers, therefore, to describe the central machine, from which the motion comes, not only as an automaton, but as an autocrat. In these spacious halls the benignant power of steam summons around him his myriads of willing menials. Ure, 1st C, page 18. Along with the tool, the skill of the workman in handling it passes over to the machine. The capabilities of the tool are emancipated from the restraints that are inseparable from human labor power. Thereby the technical foundation on which is based the division of labor in manufacture is swept away. Hence, in the place of the hierarchy of specialized workmen that characterizes manufacturer, there steps, in the automatic factory, a tendency to equalize and reduce to one and the same level every kind of work that has to be done by the minders of the machines in the place of the artificially produced differentiations of the detail workmen, step the natural differences of age and sex. Footnote. Ure, 1st C, page 3-1. See Karl Marx, 1st C, pages 140 through 141. So far as division of labor reappears in the factory, it is primarily a distribution of the workmen among the specialized machines, and of masses of workmen, not, however, organized into groups, among the various departments of the factory, in each of which they work at a number of similar machines placed together. Their cooperation, therefore, is only simple. The organized group, peculiar to manufacture, is replaced by the connection between the head workman and his few assistants. The essential division is, into workmen who are actually employed on the machines, among whom are included a few who look after the engine, and into mere attendants, almost exclusively children, of these workmen. Among the attendants are reckoned more or less all feeders, who supply the machines with the material to be worked. 
In addition to these two principal classes, there is a numerically unimportant class of persons, whose occupation it is to look after the whole of the machinery and repair it from time to time, such as engineers, mechanics, joiners, etc. This is a superior class of workmen, some of them scientifically educated, others brought up to a trade. It is distinct from the factory operative class, and merely aggregated to it. This division of labor is purely technical. Footnote. It looks very like intentional misleading by statistics, which misleading it would be possible to prove in detail in other cases, too, when the English factory legislation excludes from its operation the class of laborers last mentioned in the text, while the parliamentary returns expressly included in the category of factory operatives not only engineers and mechanics and etc., but also managers, salesmen, messengers, warehousemen, packers, etc., in short, everybody except the owner of the factory himself. To work at a machine, the workman should be taught from childhood, in order that he may learn to adapt his own movements to the uniform and unceasing motion of an automaton. When the machinery, as a whole, forms a system of manifold machines, working simultaneously and in concert, the cooperation based upon it requires the distribution of various groups of workmen among the different kinds of machines. But the employment of machinery does away with the necessity of crystallizing this distribution after the manner of manufacture, by the constant annexation of a particular man to a particular function. Footnote. Ure grants this. He says, In case of need, the workman can be moved at the will of the manager from one machine to another, and he triumphantly exclaims, Such a change is in flat contradiction with the old routine, that divides the labor, and to one workman assigns the task of fashioning the head of a needle, to another the sharpening of the point. He had much better have asked himself why this old routine is departed from in the automatic factory, only in case of need. End note. Since the motion of the whole system does not proceed from the workmen, but from the machinery, a change of persons can take place at any time without an interruption of the work. The most striking proof of this is afforded by the relay system, put into operation by the manufacturers during their revolt from 1848 to 1850. Lastly, the quickness with which machine work is learnt by young people does away with the necessity of bringing up for exclusive employment by machinery a special class of operatives. Footnote. When distress is very great, as, for instance, during the American Civil War, the factory operative is now and then set by the bourgeois to do the roughest of work, such as road-making, etc. The English Ateliers Nationaux, National Workshops, of 1862 and the following years, established for the benefit of destitute cotton operatives, differ from the French of 1848 in this, that in the latter the workmen had to do the unproductive work at the expense of the state, in the former they had to do productive municipal work to the advantage of the bourgeois, and that, too, cheaper than the regular workmen, with whom they were thus thrown into competition. The physical appearance of the cotton operatives is unquestionably improved. This I attribute, as to the men, to outdoor labor on public works. Rep. of Inspect. of Fact, 31st October, 1863, page 59. The writer here alludes to the Preston factory operatives, who were employed on Preston Moor. End note. With regard to the work of the mere attendants, it can to some extent be replaced in the mill by machines, and owing to its extreme simplicity, it allows of a rapid and constant change of the individuals burdened with this drudgery. Footnote. An example. The various mechanical apparatus introduced since the Act of 1844 into woolen mills for replacing the labor of children. So soon as it shall happen that the children of the manufacturers themselves have to go through a course of schooling as helpers in the mill, this almost unexplored territory of mechanics will soon make remarkable progress. Of machinery, perhaps self-acting mules are as dangerous as any other kind. Most of the accidents from them happen to little children, from their creeping under the mules to sweep the floor whilst the mules are in motion. Several minders have been fined for this offence, but without much general benefit. If machine-makers would only invent a self-sweeper, 
by whose use the necessity for these little children to creep under the machinery might be prevented, it would be a happy addition to our protective measures. Reports of Inspectors of Factories for the 31st of October, 1866, page 63, end note. Although then, technically speaking, the old system of division of labor is thrown overboard by machinery, it hangs on in the factory, as a traditional habit handed down from manufacture, and is afterwards systematically remolded and established in a more hideous form by capital, as a means of exploiting labor power. The lifelong specialty of handling one and the same tool now becomes the lifelong specialty of serving one and the same machine. Machinery is put to a wrong use, with the object of transforming the workman, from his very childhood, into a part of a detail machine. Note. So much, then, for Proudhon's wonderful idea. He construes machinery not as a synthesis of instruments of labor, but as a synthesis of detail operations for the benefit of the laborer himself. End note. In this way, not only are the expenses of his reproduction considerably lessened, but at the same time his helpless dependence upon the factory as a whole, and therefore upon the capitalist, is rendered complete. Here, as everywhere else, we must distinguish between the increased productiveness due to the development of the social process of production, and that due to the capitalist exploitation of that process. In handicrafts and manufacture, the workman makes use of a tool. In the factory, the machine makes use of him. There the movements of the instrument of labor proceed from him. Here it is the movements of the machine that he must follow. In manufacture, the workmen are parts of a living mechanism. In the factory, we have a lifeless mechanism independent of the workman, who becomes its mere living appendage. The miserable routine of endless drudgery and toil in which the same mechanical process is gone through over and over again is like the labor of Sisyphus. The burden of labor, like the rock, keeps ever falling back on the worn-out laborer. Note. Friedrich Engels, 1st C., page 217. Even an ordinary and optimus free trader, like Mr. Molinari, goes so far as to say, Un homme sus plus vite un surveillant, quinze heures par jour, l'évolution uniforme d'un mécanisme qu'un exerçant dans le même espace de temps sa force physique, ce travail de surveillance qui servirait peut-être de l'utile gymnastique à l'intelligence, s'il n'était pas, pas trop prolongé de tuerie à la langue par son excès et l'intelligence et la croix même. A man becomes exhausted more quickly when he watches over the uniform motion of a mechanism for fifteen hours a day, than when he applies his physical strength over the same period of time. This labor of surveillance, which might perhaps serve as a useful exercise for the mind, if it did not go on too long, destroys both the mind and the body in the long run, through excessive application. G. de Molinari, Etude Economique, Paris, 1846. End note. At the same time that factory work exhausts the nervous system to the uttermost, it does away with the many-sided play of the muscles, and confiscates every atom of freedom, both in bodily and intellectual activity. Footnote. Friedrich Engels, 1st C, page 216. End note. The lightening of the labor, even, becomes a sort of torture, since the machine does not free the laborer from work, but deprives the work of all interest. Every kind of capitalist production, in so far as it is not only a labor process, but also a process of creating surplus value, has this in common, that it is not the workman that employs the instruments of labor, but the instruments of labor that employ the workmen. But it is only in the factory system that this inversion, for the first time, acquires technical and palpable reality. By means of its conversion into an automaton, the instrument of labor confronts the laborer, during the labor process, in the shape of capital, of dead labor, that dominates and pumps dry living labor power. The separation of the intellectual powers of production from the manual labor, and the conversion of those powers into the might of capital over labor, 
is, as we have already shown, finally completed by modern industry erected on the foundation of machinery. The special skill of each individual insignificant factory operative vanishes as an infinitesimal quantity before the science, the gigantic physical forces, and the mass of labor that are embodied in the factory mechanism, and together with that mechanism constitute the power of the master. This master, therefore, in whose brain the machinery and his monopoly of it are inseparably united, whenever he falls out with his hands, contemptuously tells them, the factory operatives should keep in wholesome remembrance the fact that theirs is really a low species of skilled labor, and that there is none which is more easily acquired, or of its quality more amply remunerated, or which by a short training of the least expert can be more quickly, as well as abundantly acquired. The master's machinery really plays a far more important part in the business of production than the labor and the skill of the operative, which sixth month's education can teach, and a common laborer can learn. Footnote. The Master Spinners and Manufacturers' Defense Fund, Report of the Committee, Manchester, 1854, page 17. We shall see, hereafter, that the master can sing quite another song, when he is threatened with the loss of his living automaton. End note. The technical subordination of the workman to the uniform motion of the instruments of labor, and the peculiar composition of the body of workpeople, consisting, as it does, of individuals of both sexes and of all ages, give rise to a barrack discipline, which is elaborated into a complete system in the factory, and which fully develops the before-mentioned labor of overlooking, thereby dividing the workpeople into operatives and overlookers, into private soldiers and sergeants of an industrial army. The main difficulty in the automatic factory lay above all in training human beings to renounce their dulcetory habits of work, and to identify themselves with the unvarying regularity of the complex automaton. To devise and administer a successful code of factory discipline, suited to the necessities of factory diligence, was the Herculean enterprise, the noble achievement of Ockwright. Even at the present day, when the system is perfectly organized and its labor lightened to the utmost, it is found nearly impossible to convert persons past the age of puberty into useful hands. Footnote. Ure, 1st C, page 15. Whoever knows the life history of Ockwright will never dub this barber genius noble. Of all the great inventors of the eighteenth century, he was uncontestably the greatest thiever of other people's inventions, and the meanest fellow. End note. The factory code in which capital formulates, like a private legislator, and at his own good will, his aristocracy over his workpeople, unaccompanied by that division of responsibility, in other matters so much approved of by the bourgeoisie, and unaccompanied by the still more approved representative system, this code is but the capitalistic caricature of that social regulation of the labor process, which becomes requisite in cooperation on a great scale, and in the employment in common of instruments of labor, and especially of machinery." The place of the slave-driver's lash is taken by the overlooker's book of penalties. All punishments naturally resolve themselves into fines and deductions from wages, and the law-giving talent of the factory Lycurgus so arranges matters that a violation of his laws is, if possible, more profitable to him than the keeping of them. Footnote. The slavery in which the bourgeoisie has bound the proletariat comes nowhere more plainly into daylight than in the factory system. In it all freedom comes to an end, both at law and in fact. The workman must be in the factory at half-past five. If he come a few minutes late, he is punished. If he come ten minutes late, he is not allowed to enter until after breakfast, and thus loses a quarter of a day's wage. He must eat, drink, and sleep at a word of command. The despotic bell calls him from his bed, calls him from breakfast and dinner. And how does he fare in the mill? There the master is the absolute lawgiver. He makes what regulations he pleases, he alters and makes additions to his code at pleasure, and if he insert the veriest nonsense, the courts say to the workman, 
since you have entered into this contract voluntarily, you must now carry it out. These workmen are condemned to live, from their ninth year till their death, under this mental and bodily torture. Friedrich Engels, 1st C., page 217. What, the courts say, I will illustrate by two examples. One occurs at Sheffield, at the end of 1866. In that town a workman had engaged himself for two years in a steel-works. In consequence of a quarrel with his employer he left the works, and declared that under no circumstances would he work for that master any more. He was prosecuted for breach of contract, and condemned to two months' imprisonment. If the master breaks the contract, he can be proceeded against only in a civil action, and risks nothing but money damages. After the workman has served his two months, the master invites him to return to the works, pursuant to the contract. Workman says, no, he has already been punished for the breach. The master prosecutes again, the court condemns again, although one of the judges, Mr. She, publicly denounces this as a legal monstrosity, by which a man can periodically, as long as he lives, be punished over and over again for the same offence or crime. This judgment was given not by the great unpaid, the provincial dogberries, but by one of the highest courts of justice in London. Added in the fourth German edition. This has now been done away with, with few exceptions, e.g., when public gas-works are involved, the worker in England is now put on an equal footing with the employer in case of breach of contract, and can be sued only civilly. Friedrich Engels. The second case occurs in Wiltshire at the end of November 1863. About thirty power-loom weavers, in the employment of one Harrop, a cloth manufacturer at Lowers Mill, Westbury Lee, struck work because Master Harrop indulged in the agreeable habit of making deductions from their wages for being late in the morning. Sixpence for two minutes, one shilling for three minutes, and one shilling sixpence for ten minutes. This is at the rate of nine shillings per hour, and four pounds ten shillings per diem, while the wages of the weavers on the average of a year never exceeded ten shillings to twelve shillings weekly. Harrop also appointed a boy to announce the starting time by a whistle, which he often did before six o'clock in the morning, and if the hands were not all there at the moment the whistle ceased, the doors were closed, and those hands who were outside were fined, and as there was no clock on the premises, the unfortunate hands were at the mercy of the young Harrop-inspired timekeeper. The hands on strike, the mothers of families as well as girls, offered to resume work if the timekeeper were replaced by a clock, and a more reasonable scale of fines were introduced. Harrop summoned nineteen women and girls before the magistrates for breach of contract. To the utter indignation of all present, they were each mulsted in a fine of sixpence and two shillings sixpence for cost. Harrop was followed from the court by a crowd of people who hissed him. A favorite operation with manufacturers is to punish the workpeople by deductions made from their wages on account of faults in the material worked on. This method gave rise in 1866 to a general strike in the English pottery districts. The reports of the Ch. Empth Corn, 1863-1866, to 1866, give cases where the worker not only receives no wages, but becomes, by means of his labor, and of the penal regulations, the debtor to boot of his worthy master. The late cotton crisis also furnished edifying examples of the sagacity shown by the factory autocrats in making deductions from wages. Mr. R. Baker, the inspector of factories, says, I have myself had lately to direct prosecutions against one cotton mill occupier, for having in these pinching and painful times deducted ten pence apiece from some of the young workers employed by him, for the surgeon's certificate, for which he himself had only paid six pence, when allowed by the law to deduct three pence, and by custom nothing at all. And I have been informed of another, who, in order to keep without the law, but to obtain the same object, charges the poor children who work for him a shilling each, as a fee for learning them the art and mystery of cotton-spinning, so soon as they are declared by the surgeon fit and proper persons for that occupation. There may, therefore, be undercurrent causes for such extraordinary exhibitions as strikes, not only wherever they arise, but particularly at such times as the present, which without explanation render them inexplicable to the public understanding. He alludes here to a strike of power-loom weavers at Darwin, June 1863. 
Reports of Inspectors of Factories for 30 April, 1863, pages 50 through 51. The reports always go beyond their official dates. End note. We shall here merely allude to the material conditions under which factory labor is carried on. Every organ of sense is injured in an equal degree by artificial elevation of the temperature, by the dust-laden atmosphere, by the deafening noise, not to mention danger to life and limb among the thickly crowded machinery, which, with the regularity of the seasons, issues its list of the killed and wounded in the industrial battle. Footnote. The protection afforded by the factory acts against dangerous machinery has had a beneficial effect. But there are other sources of accident which did not exist twenty years since. One, especially, viz., the increased speed of the machinery. Wheels, rollers, spindles, and shuttles are now propelled at increased and increasing rates. Fingers must be quicker and defter in their movements to take up the broken thread, for if placed with hesitation or carelessness they are sacrificed. A large number of accidents are caused by the eagerness of the workpeople to get through their work expeditiously. It must be remembered that it is of the highest importance to manufacturers that their machinery should be in motion, i.e., producing yams and goods. Every minute's stoppage is not only a loss of power, but of production, and the workpeople are urged by the overlookers, who are interested in the quantity of work turned off, to keep the machinery in motion, and it is no less important to those of the operatives who are paid by the weight or piece that the machine should be kept in motion. Consequently, although it is strictly forbidden in many, nay, in most factories, that machinery should be cleaned while in motion, it is nevertheless the constant practice in most, if not in all, that the work people do, unprovoked, pick out waste, wipe rollers and wheels, etc., while their frames are in motion. Thus, from this cause only, 906 accidents have occurred during the six months. Although a great deal of cleaning is constantly going on by day, yet Saturday is generally the day set apart for the thorough cleaning of the machinery, and a great deal of this is done while the machinery is in motion. Since cleaning is not paid for, the work people seek to get done with it as speedily as possible. Hence, the number of accidents which occur on Fridays, and especially on Saturdays, is much larger than on any other day. On the former day the excess is nearly twelve per cent, over the average number of the first four days of the week, and on the latter day the excess is twenty-five per cent, over the average of the preceding five days, or, if the number of working hours on Saturday being taken into account, seven and a half hours on Saturday, as compared with ten and a half on other days, there is an excess of sixty-five per cent on Saturdays over the average of the other five days. Report of the Inspector of Factories, 31st October, 1866, pages 9, 15, 16, and 17. End note. Economy of the social means of production, matured and forced as in a hothouse by the factory system, is turned, in the hands of capital, into systematic robbery of what is necessary for the life of the workman while he is at work, robbery of space, light, air, and of protection to his person against the dangerous and unwholesome accompaniments of the productive process, not to mention the robbery of appliances for the comfort of the workman. Is Fourier wrong when he calls factories tempered bagnos? Footnote. In Part One of Book Three, I shall give an account of a recent campaign by the English manufacturers against the clauses in the Factory Acts that protect the hands against dangerous machinery. For the present, let this one quotation from the official report of Leonard Horner suffice. I have heard some mill owners speak with inexcusable levity of some of the accidents, such, for instance, as the loss of a finger being a trifling matter. A working man's living in prospects depends so much upon his fingers that any loss of them is a very serious matter to him. When I have heard such inconsiderate remarks made, I have usually put this question. Suppose you were in want of an additional workman, and two were to apply, both equally well qualified in other respects, but one had lost a thumb or a forefinger, which would you engage? There never was a hesitation as to the answer. The manufacturers have mistaken prejudices against what they have heard represented as pseudo-philanthropic legislation. Report of the Inspector of Factories, 31st October, 1855. 
These manufacturers are clever folk, and not without reason were they enthusiastic for the slaveholders' rebellion. End note. Note. In these factories that have been longest subject to the factory acts, with their compulsory limitations of the hours of labor, and other regulations, many of the older abuses have vanished. The very improvement of the machinery demands to a certain extent improved construction of the buildings, and this is an advantage to the work people. See the report of the Inspector of Factories for the 31st October, 1863, page 109. End note. End of Part 4, Chapter 15, Section 4